Hello, my name is Lorraine Eden. I'm Professor Emerita of Management and Research Professor of Law at Texas A&M University. I'm very pleased to be invited to speak to the Condor Global webinar series today. And I thank uh, Laszlo Pastor for the opportunity to talk about my work on Amount A. Let me say that uh, I've been doing this work for, oh gee, near on two years now, I guess. But it, it really, um, other than putting in proposals, when the public was asked to provide commentary, I really didn't get heavily involved in the process until the blueprints were released in October of 20, uh, uh, on October 12th, uh, 2020. And since then, I've published a number of papers as I worked further and further into Pillar 1 Amount A, and that's what I'd like to talk with you today. Let me see if I can successfully share my share my screen with you with you here. Share. There we go. Okay, I think uh, I, I think I hope you can see my screen and I'm going to talk about this now. Right. Um, the you, you probably remember last October 12, 2020, all of these papers were released at the same time. Thousands of pages of materials were released all at once. And I tried to decide what I might usefully add to the debate. I knew there would be people studying this all over the world. And what I realized when I looked at the materials is the one piece that was least likely to be paid attention to was the economic impact assessment. First of all, there were a series of questions released in the public consultation document, and none of them had to do with the economic impact assessment. They were all on the two blueprints. And two, it's heavily mathematical, and so you would need economists who were trained in econometric methods and done a fair amount of empirical work and, and who would be comfortable with looking at this. And, and I had done both, and so I thought maybe usefully I might be able to add a little bit at the margin by focusing down on this little one down here in the corner, tax challenges arising from digitalization, the economic impact assessment. When I started out, all I really wanted to do was deep dive into the economic impact assessment and, and, and sort of see what was there. What happened was that then led me to dissect the simple analytics of the formula that led me to think about, could I do finer estimates of winners and losers than were published in the EIA? And finally, I realized there were all kinds of tax games that could be played with it. And I'm gonna to talk to you about these four research questions today. I ended up writing seven papers, which Bloomberg Tax very kindly published. They're all available in SSRN, uh, and um, I, I encourage you to have a look at those. Um, if, you're in, if you're interested. So let me start with my economic assessments of Amount A. The, how did the EIA estimate Amount A with this picture? Basically that rectangle is supposed to mean the global profits of the multinational group that are in scope. Some percent of those are defined as routine. This is the residual profitability threshold RPT, which was 10%. That meant everything above that was residual and could be placed into uh, amount A. And the percentage that would be allocated, the allocation, reallocation percentage was expected to be 10 or 20%. First thing I want you to notice is that profitability threshold of 10% isn't, that's not 10% of the, that rectangle box. It looks more like 60, which means 40 is in scope, which means maybe 10 is gonna be reallocated. This is more than you think, okay. So let me talk to you about what the economic impact assessment said. And this is a picture too. About $100 billion in profit was going to be reallocated. And it was going to market jurisdictions and out of residence and source jurisdictions, okay? 100 billion was being reallocated, but the cost of that was only going to be between five and 12 billion. Pillar two was going to be 42 to 70 billion. So we're talking about pillar one being one eighth the cost of pillar two for multinationals. So I think most multinationals looked at this and saw, thought this is peanuts, it's not gonna affect me. It's a very small amount and it's going to only affect in scope firms which are gonna be automated digital services, ADS, consumer facing businesses, CFB, 
if I'm not ADS, I'm not CFB, I'm out. You know, if I'm banking, finance, and insurance, I'm out. I'm extractive industries, I'm out. I'm B2B sales and manufacturing, I'm out. I'm services, consulting services, I'm out. So I think a lot of multinationals really just looked at this and thought it wasn't going to impact them very much. And even the ones in scope thought it wasn't very much money. Clearly, the amount of revenue effects, the estimated revenue effects, depend upon the percent here. And you can see sort of how the numbers were. The big losers were expected to be investment hubs. Now, who are the investment hubs? And there are a list in the, in the back of the economic impact assessment. We're talking uh, about Singapore, Hong Kong, Ireland, all right? Uh, and, and again, many of the tax havens would be included in that list. They're the, clearly the losers and everybody else, all the other tax jurisdictions look to be winners here. And you can see the global effect again, small, very small. So I think most people just forgot about amount A thinking it wasn't gonna matter. Now, in my deep dive into the, into the assessment, I, I came to the conclusion that it really was a leap of faith. First of all, give credit where credit is due. This was a Herculean task to put together this report. It was a very high quality econometric analysis that used the best of what was available in data. But there are all kinds of guesstimates and extrapolations for missing observations. And we didn't even really know what the results were going to be. So they did the best of a bad situation in some sense with, with trying to put some numbers here. Some of the problems I saw, one year of data was used and it happened to be the year before the United States implemented the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. So as a result, it was before the US adopted a territorial system and before it brought in guilty. In some cases, data for as few of 16 jurisdictions and OECD ones at that, were used to estimate 222 jurisdictions. And you can see how likely the estimate for, two, 20, for 16 OECD would be for 220 worldwide. Every jurisdiction was assumed to be in. So even if it didn't have any multinationals, it was in scope and defined to have sales so it could receive some money. Some outliers were excluded where they might've been important such as Hong Kong and India. Amount B wasn't even included in the estimates. Moreover, I think the assumptions were unusually optimistic. Um, all market jurisdictions were in, they all got 100% of the relief, all right, on their share of amount A. So they got what they said they were supposed to get. And there was 100% compliance by all jurisdictions, no defections, no tax games, no strategic responses by multinationals. And the counterfactual against it was judged was an all out trade war with digital services taxes spreading in all the other countries, particularly the US, but anybody was headquarters for a DST or CFB firm could uh, be involved in a uh, trade war for this. My, in addition to these two big problems, there was a third one. I was surprised, actually shocked would have been a better word, to see there was no consensus over whether the jurisdiction specific estimates would be released and the choice was not to release them. So neither you nor I, nor the multinationals uh, in the OECD group at BIAC, for example, got them, nor did the tax authorities. The, what each tax authority got was its own estimates. In other words, its own estimates as a market jurisdiction, its own estimates as a residence and source jurisdiction. And that was all it got. And I'm gonna to talk to you what that means in a minute. That means we're making a huge change in the international tax rules without a full impact study that was not released, not even to the policymakers. And I had just been, had published this summer a paper in evidence-based policymaking with respect to SDG, SDG 5 on gender, gender equality. And in that talk very much about how we need good estimates, good evidence in order to make good policymaking. And here we had the best estimates we could have given the problems but they weren't being released. So that's what led me then to sort of say, could I do better? And I thought, well, first I've got to dissect the formula. And then I wanted to know whether I could provide better estimates of winners and losers than we're in here. So let me talk to you about the formula. The formula, which I'm sure you've seen is made up of two parts, A and B, which determine the pi, which is called amount A, that's the amount for redistribution. CD and E and F, 
which are jurisdiction specific numbers, which determine how much each jurisdiction gets. So the first one is amount A. The second one is the net percentage change that goes to the jurisdiction. And these things added up over all the jurisdictions should just wipe. In other words, what the relieving jurisdictions get up are supposed to be equal what the tax jurisdictions receive. Now, let me talk to you about some of the insights I had from seeing this. Now, there's some obvious things. If A and B increase, the pie goes up. And the greater the pie, the amount available for redistribution. What affects the pie? The definition of what's in scope, what profit is, what is the residual profit threshold, and what is the allocation percent. So for example, let me show you this here. Here's the residual profitability threshold at 10. And, and I've actually done shown this with 10 and looking closer to 10% of the whole box. If you give 10 uh, as routine, then 90 is available to be redistributed. And then depending upon the reallocation percentage, that determines the size of the red box, right? So the reallocation percentage in most of the estimates is done at 10 or 20. But as we know from this October, it's been now raised to 25%. Let me show you what that actually means. So first of all, let me start out about the 10% threshold at the bottom. If you look here, to this little piece in these pictures, this shows you, the black shows you how much money is redistributed when the, when the residual is 10%, all right? The, basically the, the threshold is 10%. And what happens if it's raised to 20%? And what you can see here is the amount of losses to the losers, the investment hub doubles. It's 2% in this one here, as you can see, but it's less than 1% if the RPT is, is at 10, then, then, um, then at 20. So in other words, the lower the residual profitability threshold, the more available to be moved and the larger this is. So the black rectangles are bigger than the gray ones here. And you can see this here, the winner's gains are bigger with the black rectangles than they are with the gray ones. Now, Notice I showed you here investment hubs lose 2%. Two, two what happens if we go from a reallocation percentage of 10% to a reallocation of 20%? The hubs go from a loss of 2% of global corporate income tax revenues to a loss of 4 The winners get more money. So basically, the gains and losses get bigger as you play with these, with these percentages. So that determines the pie. What determines an individual jurisdiction, which I've called J, it's net gain or loss and tax base here. Well, what I realized is if you take that formula and you set the corporate income tax rate on, on the received income equal to cap corporate income tax rate on the relieved income, you can take that T out. And you can see I have taken the T out here, which leaves you what's called the C minus E gap. And whether a jurisdiction is a winner or loser depends upon whether the C minus E gap is positive or negative. And this isn't just mine. This was what the economic impact assessment did. It calculated C minus E gaps in calculating winners and, and losers. So to figure out who wins and who loses, you need the sign and the size of the C minus E gap. Now, that then tells you a really obvious point. If I'm any jurisdiction, I can affect whether I win or lose from amount A if I can play with the C minus E gap. What I want to do is if I'm a market jurisdiction who expects to be winning here, I want to raise my C minus E gap. I want to blow up my sales and I want to shrink the amount of profits declared in that jurisdiction, widening the gap so I get more money. On the other hand, if I'm a losing jurisdiction, I'm a very small market jurisdiction, all right? So I don't have much sales, but a lot of profits there, like investment hubs, okay? What investment hubs want to do here is they want to shrink their losses. So they need to pump up sales somehow in their jurisdiction, and they need to shift out that corporate income tax base and move it somewhere else. So can the jurisdictions play pillar one tax games? I think they're likely. And I think we can see from this very clearly how jurisdictions are going to pay them. My fourth insight here was to realize that this really is global formulary apportionment. Now, the OECD will tell you it isn't, but it is. It's sales-based global formulary apportionment. And the way you could see that is if you play with the formula again. And what I've done is substituted instead of GIDS, 
I substituted just S for sales. And instead of grip, I've substituted P for profit. So what you see here is a minus P over S. That's return on sales. That's profits over sales, return on sales in your jurisdiction. This is the worldwide average return on sales. Now, what this is telling you is if this is a jurisdiction that is a, a dynamic, profitable jurisdiction with a return on sales in that jurisdiction for the multinationals that are in scope is above the average, all right? They are going, if that's a very profitable, dynamic jurisdiction, they are going to owe amount A. In other words, if P divided by S, which is the jurisdiction specific number, is high and is higher than the average, this jurisdiction is going to have to provide tax base relief, all right? The hubs obviously are, are going to be in there. But a lot of other jurisdictions that are very profitable, and I would argue the U.S. is one of those, are going to end up having to provide more tax relief on the foreign source multinationals in their midst. Remember, this doesn't apply to the domestic multinationals in the domestic country. So this is not Hungarian multinationals in Hungary. This is American multinationals, German, French, Japanese, Chinese multinationals in Hungary. And what we're asking is how profitable are they in Hungary relative to the worldwide average profitability for these multinationals? And if Hungary turns out to be a very profitable one such that return on sales is high here, Hungary would then need to provide tax relief on the, um, uh, for these particular multinationals and give that up to market jurisdictions and specifically to stagnant ones where the return on sales is significantly less. So when you look at the formula, all of a sudden what you see is this is sales-based global formulary apportionment. There is a one factor, sales. You know, uh, in most places there's a three factor model that's based on property, plant, and equipment, on uh, labor, and on sales. This is the single factor global formulary apportionment model and uh, if your jurisdiction is above the world average, you are identified as relieving. If you're below, you will be identified as receiving. Now, that led me to think about another thing. What practical experience do we have with global formulary apportionment? Well, not much. We have two federal systems, Canada and the United States, that at their sub-federal level, use formulary apportionment to allocate the state level, in other words, a sub-tier level corporate income tax revenue. 40 states are in a compact in the United States to allocate their income in a three-factor formula, capital, labor, and sales. Same thing is going on in Canada. I think there's one province, I think it's Quebec, that is not included uh, in, in this approach. But Basically, what I've shown you here is the 2018 figures for the United States. So for the 40 states that are in the compact, which is a three-factor formula, remember, not a one-factor formula, the amount of money that is raised is peanuts. The state corporate income compact raised $48.2 billion out of $1.03 trillion. That is less than 5%. So less than 5% of state corporate income taxes in the United States are raised this way. That's an extraordinarily small amount of experience to want to impose that on the whole world <laughs> and a large number of multinationals. Now, let me say that we do have the corporate consolidated tax base uh, that the European Union has been proposing some time. Uh, on the other hand, it's been discussed, but not adopted. And I assume a lot of the discussions that went on in the EU were on why this was not an appropriate way to allocate corporate income taxes within the EU. Um, my own view is I, I certainly wish that if this is coming down the tubes that we would try it at the European Union through the corporate consolidated tax base first and let the European Union have five years or 10 years experience with it before we put this on the whole world. The lack of experience with formulary apportionment strikes me as, as very odd, it does. All right, let me turn to my third one, which is to talk about winners and losers from amount A. 
What I realized is the economists who did the economic impact assessment used large matrices that look like this. And this is out of an OECD webinar where basically they took a variety of data on, on rows and, and columns and did the estimates. They used at the back of the at the back of the economic impact assessment four large matrices, and in particular two: one for sales and one for profits. And I put the profits one here. And by the way, I want you to, when you have a look at the web and you have a look at these slides, have a look at components L, M, and N. L, M, and N are the investment hubs here, and so you can see that you know what percentage they are of all these other jurisdictions. And there are lists in the back of the hub that tell you actually who was in here. Okay, so let me go back to this. If we know amount A, we can calculate the C minus E gap and we can figure out whether a jurisdiction is going to be winner or loser here. And so my, I did a variety of papers doing these estimates and I'm just gonna quickly show you them. This one really is uh, was my first one and it was based as close as I could to the e economic impact assessment. The red ones identify places where E is greater than C and so they're gonna have to give up tax base. So in residence jurisdiction, high income residence jurisdictions are gonna have to give up tax base. Investment hubs uh, who are the host countries to these multinationals are gonna give up tax base. Also, middle income jurisdictions that are resident to multinationals will gain, and middle and high income residents that are hosts to, are going to gain. So what you see here is who's going to lose, where the parents are in high income countries, like the United States, that would be England, Germany, right? France, for example, high income jurisdictions for parents are going to lose, and investment hubs are going to lose, and it sure looks like everybody else is going to gain. Well, what I started doing is digging down finer, and here is one for investment hubs. And you see what happens is investment hubs also, well, these are all investment hubs here, nobody else but investment hubs. And what you see is high income investment hubs. Now, who are they? Well, they're Switzerland, they're the Netherlands, they're Ireland, all right? They're going to lose from amount A. They're going to be expected to give up base. In other words, where the principles are located, are going to expect it to give up tax base. This is why Ireland didn't want to join uh, on the latest proposal because it knows that Ireland would be expected to give up tax base under pillar one amount A. And again, the host to these firms, the, the investment hubs are also going to lose here. Now, I started in uh, my third paper on here trying to address the question as to whether Canadian and multi, whether Canada and the United States would gain or lose. And what I realized is Canada and the United States dominate the high income category in the Americas. If you look at the income in the Americas, the US is, I don't know, 60% of the total. So if you can figure out what's happening in high income in the Americas, you can figure out pretty much is what's going to happen in the United States. What I realized when you do that, what matters are um, uh, on two arrows, the horizontal arrow, which tells you high income Americas as a source jurisdiction. In other words, foreign multinationals in the United States and Canada. And what happens from a residence perspective, that's the vertical arrow, that's um, um, American multinationals when American multinationals go abroad to places like Hungary and France and, and Germany. I then was able to figure out how to redo this specifically using Bureau of Economic Analysis on MOFAs, that's American majority owned foreign affiliates abroad. So the MOFAs would be um, American multinationals in Hungary, for example. And MOSAs, which are foreign multinationals in the United States. So if you look at these numbers, let me just talk to you about these numbers. This is basically saying that Canadian and European multinationals, all right, that are in the United States earn above average profitability. And, and that makes sense. Canadian and European MEs in the United States have been there far longer. They've acclimatized to the US, they're developed much longer, and they are more profitable than Latin American firms or most Asia Pacific firms, for example, in the US. Because their return on sales is above the average relative to the total, 
they will be expected to provide tax relief. Now, let me say what that means. That means the US government, the IRS, must provide tax relief on European and Canadian multinationals in the United States. It must give up taxing Canadian MEs and European MEs, including Hungarian MEs in the United States. Now, vice versa, the vertical column is showing you MOFAs, American multinationals that are in Europe. And who's the loser there? Europe and Latin America. Now, what that means is, is that American MOFAs in Europe, in Hungary, in Italy, in, in Germany, in France, they are above average profitability compared to foreign multinationals there. The Americans are above average profitability and therefore they would be expected to give up the, those jurisdictions, the French and the Germans and the Hungarians, uh, tax authorities would be expected to give up tax base vis-a-vis -vis the United States. Now, this is the data the United States got. The United States got only its own row and its own column. Hungary got the Hungarian row and the Hungarian column. Ireland got the Irish row and the Irish column. Every jurisdiction is making decisions on amount A based on their own row and their own column. They don't have the full matrix here. Okay, let me just talk to you then. I also did estimates, one of the papers on looking at industries and I did all of the industries and I think it's important because one of the things we know is that finance and insurance and natural resources were taken out. And look who's in the red here. Mining, uh, automated digital services, finance and insurance, all right? This is American firms in Europe are profitable in natural resources, ADS and finance and insurance. Who got out of the pillar one net? Mining and finance insurance were excluded. What happens in here for foreign multinationals in the United States, manufacturing and finance and insurance uh, were high, are high profit. Finance and insurance got an exemption. Manufacturing is going to be hit hard. Now, what I mean by that is if some sectors escape and are not in scope, more is paid by the others. So taking finance and insurance and mining out means info gets hit harder here and any of the other jurisdictions will change and get hit harder here and vice versa. If you pull finance and insurance out of the foreign investment in the US, manufacturing gets harder. So let me end up by talking about pillar one tax gains. This is out of the uh, October the 8th presentation of the two pillar solution. And it, it is, uh, it's an interesting picture because it's, uh, it shows you three countries that are tax gaining tax receiving, they're all market jurisdiction, they're getting 25% of the residual profits allocated to them. Where's it coming from? Where are the tax relieving ones? They're not there. In other words, the picture is telling you the tax relief is actually coming from the multinationals. The redistribution of what is $125 billion in this picture is coming from the multinationals themselves. It's not being given up by the tax relieving jurisdictions. And I actually think this is a pretty accurate picture. <laughs> although I don't think the OECD meant to say this. The OECD is still arguing that although 125 gets moved around, it's a wash. The relievers are just offset by the receivers and all that matters is the differences in the tax rates. I think this is a much more accurate picture. And if I were a multinational that was in scope, I would be much more concerned about this. And then and, and frankly, remember that the in scope, which is listed now is what, 74, 76 multinationals, but the percentages are going down more and more MEs will be in scope. And we are still in a COVID recession, right? Many firms have gone bankrupt. They're trying to climb out of bankruptcy. And now we're putting a huge tax burden on those firms. And it isn't all just gonna come from US multinationals as I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, how are we supposed to pay for that 125 billion? Who's providing the tax relief? Well, there was a four-step formula here. And one of the things we learn is the four-step formula is very fuzzy. 
And what I've heard is the one that's actually proposed is actually four, the pro rata allocation. I've heard it called the waterfall method, where basically you go after the jurisdictions where they're most profitable and you take that one down to the next one. And then you take it down to the next one and you take it down to the next one. What it's telling you is who's in scope are where the principles of these firms are located and then where the investment hubs and tax, uh, tax havens are located. I think the fuzziness of this process is going to encourage pillar one tax gains, such as who me, not me, if not me, then who? You know, if I, I'm not gonna pay this, I'm gonna pass the hot potato or pass the buck to someone else. And I'm reminded of the old children's uh, game um, I can't pay the rent, you know, where the landlord comes up to the um, renter and says, you must pay the rent. And the woman says, I can't pay the rent. And the woman and the tax, the tax receiver says, you must pay the rent. And the uh, woman says, I can't pay the rent. And along comes the hero and says, the hero is going to pay the rent. And let's talk about who the hero might be here. So as I said, I'm expecting governments to game the system based on component C and component, and component E. How are they gonna do this? They're gonna play with the components, but I think the big one that matters is every jurisdiction, this so-called market jurisdiction is gonna try and grow its share of what it gets, but the tax relieving jurisdictions are not gonna to wanna to pay. And remember what they're not gonna to wanna to pay on. They're not gonna to wanna to pay on their own multinationals. They're not gonna to wanna to pay on the foreign multinationals that have profits in their midst. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that in a minute. Okay, so let me just talk to you about that briefly. I, I have in one of my papers, this is here. The back of the uh, pillar one blueprint was an estimate of how this would work for centralized m and And I want you to notice the net impact is zero. Then they did a very simple decentralized case and the net impact was zero. So I complicated it with two full-fledged distributors and two routine distributors. And what I realized is it was quite possible to play with this. And if you played with this, the net impact is the global tax and the multinational rises substantially. It is not zero. Okay, so let me talk about who pays the rent. Amount A ignored the fact that most governments are on a territorial tax system. What that means is they no longer tax offshore income. They tax corporate income tax to the water's edge. They don't tax offshore income. They have already paid the rent. They gave up the right to tax offshore foreign source income. They paid the rent and they don't intend to pay it twice, all right? It's source countries where the rent, the base is currently located and it's foreign multinational. So from a Hungarian perspective, the worry is, um, are there Hungarian multinationals in the United States? And what's the IRS going to do in terms of, will it be willing to give up that tax base? If it doesn't, that tax base is taxed twice and vice versa. What's the Hungarian tax authority going to do with all the foreign multinationals that are in Hungary? All right, is there a way, uh, will it want, to give up that tax base. I mean, Hungary, I assume, has just been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic as much as the rest of us. People are out of work, firms have gone bankrupt, tax revenue was needed to get the economy afloat. Having to give up tax base is difficult and give it up on foreign multinationals. It's not like you're giving it up on your own multinationals, you're giving it up on foreign m and in your jurisdiction. So what if governments don't? What if the IRS says, I'm not willing to give up the tax base on foreign source multinationals in the United States? Well, two things happen. One, the foreign multinationals get taxed twice. And two, it creates a discriminatory barrier between multinationals, foreign m and that are in the pillar one net and those that aren't. Those that are in the pillar one net can get taxed twice. Those ones that aren't only get taxed once. And remember, there's a, a third impact here is that foreign multinationals in the net that get taxed twice, they suffer a burden relative to domestic multinationals. So suppose we took a consumer facing business or a manufacturing firm, and you've got foreign manufacturing firms in the United States, and they're in competition with American firms. If you want to erect a non-tariff barrier, you refuse to provide tax relief to the foreign firms. The foreign firms get taxed twice under amount A. 
the American firms are unscathed. What I think will happen is large jurisdictions will engage in the trade war, where, or really a tax war, where each of them will refuse to provide tax release. And the net impact of that will be overall the taxes on the firms go up significantly. And small jurisdictions like Hungary, like Ireland, like Mexico, like Canada, get sideswiped here. Multinationals too can play with these. And I've, I've, I've figured out some ways that multinationals can actually game their own formula. Frankly, what they want to do is look at where the tax rates are high. So they want to look at the tax rate in the market jurisdiction and compare it with the tax rate in something that's going to be a relieving jurisdiction. And they do not want to move profits into a jurisdiction, all right, into a jurisdiction that has a very high tax rate. Because they want to, um, obviously they want to, just like multinationals want to maximize global profits after tax, they will want to maximize global profits after tax, including amount A tax. So they will take amount A tax into their calculations and figure out how to do this. Now, remember, we're talking about applying this to the world's largest multinationals with the best lawyers and the best accountants and consulting advisors. Do you think they'll be able to figure out ways to avoid paying amount A tax? I do. I do. I can think of some ways to do it myself. And I'm not a, a high paid uh, lawyer advising on these situations. So I think transfer pricing will still matter. Transfer pricing will still be driven by tax differentials. It's just those tax differentials now include amount A tax. And if you go back to my example, the decentralized m &E, that one is an example showing where the multinationals can avoid paying the tax. OK, let me wrap up. What I want to talk to you about now is where we are today. There have been a few changes. ADS and, and uh, consumer facing businesses are gone. We went to top seeing the top 100, top 100, which is really right now apparently about 75. But notice, as I said, the floor is going down. More multinationals will be in scope over time. And as I said, extractives and financial services got out. The reallocation percent is up to 25. The total pie is now up. Uh, gone up 25% to $125 billion. Who's a market jurisdiction? Nexus has been dropped to $1 million US dollars in sales and to $250,000 for the lowest income multinationals. Now, think about this. If I'm a multinational and I don't want to provide tax relief in that jurisdiction and all I have is $250,000 sales there, what do I do? I leave. I think many jurisdictions have not taken into account that multinationals are likely to go to get out them being classified as a market jurisdiction, all right? Number five, there is supposed to be a safe harbor that is gonna cap the residual profits through amount A. It's not very clear exactly what that means and whether that really is amount B or not. It's not clear in the materials that released. There is supposed to be a multi, um, Oh, and tax relief, we get a one line sentence drawn from those that earn residual profit. We know even less now than we did a year ago about what that, about that means. At least we, the public, know less now than we did. And as I said, what I've heard is a waterfall method, a pro rata allocation that is going to be allocated to all across jurisdictions. But they're going to have to pay in to somebody and through somebody. There's going to be a multilateral convention to implement Mount A. All parties are supposed to get rid of their digital services taxes. Um, you could sign as of 2022. One unit within the MNE group can handle. I assume that will be the parent. The parent, if it wants to maximize global profits after tax, including after Mount A tax, will want to do this all at one place where it has all the data and could figure out how to reduce the Mount A tax or profit from differences between the amount A tax and other forms of corporate income tax, for example. There is minding, excuse me, mandatory binding arbitration, except for some low capacity developing countries. I actually find it very hard to imagine the US Senate is going to sign off on this. It needs a, it needs a treaty and a treaty that includes mandatory binding arbitration that affects primarily American multinationals strikes me as highly unlikely to, to happen. And then lastly, there is supposed to be something on, on amount B. So let me conclude. Amount A introduces sales-based formulary apportionment at a global level. And as I've shown, we, we do very little of it now. We raise very little money 
what, $5 billion worldwide. And I think it's really high risk. We do it in a federal system where there's a, a top tier government that can make sure this happens. We're gonna do it at the global level without the benefit of a beneficial omniscient, when I'm, I'm a benevolent omniscient dictator. When I studied my public finance uh, and when I did my dissertation, um, what I learned at Dalhousie was about benevolent omniscient dictators. And they actually do get you to the optimum optimum and they make sure that all things balance. There is no benevolent omniscient dictator, no bod here to make sure that this is going to work. There's no upper tier level. In addition, there's gonna be a two layered system. We're not getting rid of the current system of residents and source jurisdictions. That's gonna remain. And as I said, Almost everybody's on a territorial system. They already paid the rent and they're not gonna pay it twice. And so that means source jurisdictions where the, the host countries to the multinationals, their tax authorities are going to be asked to pay the rent and give that up to so-called market jurisdictions with large populations like India and China and Indonesia, for example. And the question is, will they be willing to do that or not? With the big ticket items, finance and insurance and natural resource multinationals out, most of the costs are gonna fall on the ADS and manufacturing sector. And the lists are being published now of who's in. So you can have a look at those lists and see who's in. I don't think this had very much to do with where we started back in 2013, when we were interested in taxing the digital economy. I also think there are gonna be all kinds of pillar one games here. That mean the real cost of this is gonna be borne by multinationals. My view is there are better, simpler, and there are principled ways to tax 21st century multinationals. We don't need this political method. I think you know the, the G20 and the inclusive framework are gonna declare a victory. We're gonna get a convention. Some will sign, some won't. There'll be lots of clauses in the convention. Some will sign and some won't. So we will get a paper tiger and there will be some multinationals in and some not. We're layering one system on another, but we'll be able to claim victory here because we got a convention signed. We could have done this so much easier. For example, I really don't think DSTs are so bad. You know, why should we exempt digital services? When I buy a Kindle book, I don't pay a sales tax on it. But when I buy a paper book, I do. I'm discriminating between a digital book and a paper book. Why should I do that? For a long time, you could argue, argue the digital industry was an infant industry and it deserved to be protected. It's an in infant industry that is clearly grown up. We are discriminating in favor of digital industries and we don't need to do that now. I could argue for discriminating in favor of digital infrastructure, ICT infrastructure, particularly in developing countries who don't have the ICT infrastructure to compete in the global economy. Getting countries to the level of the ICT infrastructure of Singapore, for example, or of the Bahamas or Bermuda would be really important if these countries are gonna compete in the digital economy of the 21st century. We could allow subsidies for that kind of, of types of investment. But when I buy a Kindle book online, there's no reason for me to not be paying tax on that. We can use taxes on digital services, and I think we should. The key thing I would believe is digital services belong under the General Agreement on Trade and Services, the GATS, which is WTO. What we need to do is allow digital services, but not have them non, but make them be non-discriminatory. They need to meet most favored nation and national treatment rules. They need to be handled under the GATS. So for example, they could be in VAT taxes where there's no difference between domestic taxes on digital transactions and on foreign taxes on digital transactions. In other words, you build the, the digital tax you're indifferent between whether it's on a foreign firm or it's on a domestic firm. It just simply applies to all digital transactions and makes them equal with transactions in the traditional brick and mortar economy. So I would have done that first. And second, I think we need to define, redefine permanent establishment for 21st century multinationals. We now have scale without mass. It needs to be for foreign direct investment. Those F, that foreign direct investment does need to have a permanent attachment to the host economy. Maybe there's no warehouse there. 
maybe there's no brick and mortar, but it is a longstanding attachment that, that can be defined as foreign direct investment. So in effect, I think we need a new definition of FDI and a new definition of PE, and we need to allow digital services taxes, and we need to ditch amount idea, amount A. It's a bad idea. It's a political idea. It is not principled. And I think it, it leads us down a road that we've had very little experience with and might potentially, particularly during COVID-19 and the, the serious recession the global economy is still in, it's a problem. So let me stop the share there and, and, and say, um, I, I appreciate very much the opportunity to be invited to speak to the Condor Global webinar. And um, I hope you found my comments interesting. Um, the papers are all freely available online. And uh, I hope you'll get involved in this, that I think it's a huge change in the international tax system, one of the most important, maybe the most important in my lifetime. Pillar two with the GLOBE project fits in the current international tax system. It takes advantage of the existing rules. It does not require a new system. And I can see a global minimum tax and I've written why I think that's okay. And I think it's okay to actually you know, deny deductions when nobody's taxing at the other end. You shouldn't have income that can completely escape tax. Um, so I'm much more optimistic about pillar two, simply because I believe it is principled and it's not the first best solution, but it's doable and it, it, it's workable and it, it is legitimate. Amount A, I think is outside the existing system layers on it and like Teutonic plates is not going to mesh very well and we're going to have some earthquakes here. And I really worry that in a period of time where we need more investment in the digital economy, we need to bring the developing countries up so they can participate in the, in the developing country. We may be making very bad decisions here um, on this. And so I'll stop there and, and um, thank you very much.